six. Angelos. Hey. Zeus. May. Erisantos. Pain. He atone. Arcane. Allah. Apolipontos. To. Ideon. Oikoterion. Ace. Threesen. Megales. Cameros. Desmos. And then Adios. Sounds like I did that. Adios then. Hippo. Sophon. Pet. Reckon. Yeah. All right. There's some really interesting words in this verse. I'm going to get to them. Angelos. What do you think that means? Angels. angels. All right. Angels. Uh, the ones. Here is a little. That word te there. You can unit is it an or both. And you can say here an or both angels. The ones not having kept. All right, having guarded, also having guarded the of themselves their uh, estate, their principality, their place of authority. That word arcane there, <coughs> their their headship. All right, their first place of rule, and the word having kept there is also the word comes from the word. And it's the first Irish participle active. Accused of plural masculine, by the way. The ones not having kept or guarded their place of authority. Okay, what is it talking about? It's talking about the uh, Lucifer. Lucifer. All right. Lucifer. All right, Lucifer. God had a place for him. In a, of authority. And he didn't keep it, did he? What did he do? What did Lucifer do? When God placed him over the material realm of the universe, what did Lucifer do? Rebelled. Well, what did he do he first? Rebelled, but he put the, uh, took part of the mm -hmm. Well, for a long, for a while, we know that he glorified God. And God tells us how he glorified him, that he was a beautiful creation, that God created him beautiful, and that he did serve God for a while, but he got proud. And he thought that he could overcome God. And by the way, Lucifer is extremely smart. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you have little pet sins in your life that you like? And you don't like turning loose of them? That's Lucifer. That's for that. He knows your weaknesses. And he will throw them at you. He will make it absolutely easy for you to do that. <laughs> he will lead you that way. All right? He does. He will do it. That is what did he do in the garden. He didn't approach the man, did he? He didn't approach the woman with the man, did he? If he'd approached man and woman together, do you think that they would have even listened to Lucifer? They get away, boy. And husband, who's that? Go, oh, don't you mess with him. And they, that wouldn't happen, would it? But he approached the woman, and what did he tell her? She can feel. What do women like? Bickering. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they like to bicker too. Yeah, that's an absolute fact. Food. They like food. What else? Say she was just as good, as, or she could have been just as good as uh, God. Well, isn't, isn't that kind of what he said? Well, we're, we're not there yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. What do women like? Flattery. Oh, they like flattery. But what do what things do women like? Material things. Things. All right. So what did the devil tell the woman? Let's go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Look at here. Look at this here tree. Look at this fruit on this tree. It's going to taste good, food. It looks good. It's pretty. Pretty thing. And I'll took her shopping. 
And then he says, and it'll make you wise. And God doesn't want you to be as smart as he does. But you know that woman was clothed with innocence and with absolute glory. She was. And she laid it all aside to go shopping. To get something that she wasn't supposed to touch. And that's exactly what the Satan does to us. He puts out things. You know, I don't have to tell you what's right and wrong, do I? It's already here. You know, it's, it's there, isn't it? You know when you do wrong. Satan always blazes a trail for you to get to do that thing. He throws this little apple. Mm, that's a nice looking apple right there. Oh, I like that. How many times are we tempted by the things that we know that are evil and we go there anyway? The Bible says to shun the even the appearance of evil. Don't go around it. But we go and we rub in it. How many of you have ever had a dog that liked to go rubbing dead stuff? That dog we got out there right now, Bruno? If there's anything dead or smelly on that place, he's going to go lay down and rub it all over himself. Well, children of God are that way too sometimes. And of course, the lost world is all that way. They love the roll in it. Love the roll in it. Satan tempted man triunely. He did. He, he tempted man, or mankind, and the woman. First of all, it was pretty. It looked pretty. It looked pretty. That's physical. It was going to taste good. What's that? Huh? Huh? It was tempting. It was tempting. It was going to taste good. It was going to be delightful to the taste. Okay? And then what else? He tempted her soul also. Because she was going to become like God. And of course she fell, didn't she? When Adam come up there, and remember, these two were clothed with glory, with the glory of God. They were naked, but they were clothed with the glory of God. The glory of God covered them and made them not naked. And Adam came up and the woman had already fallen. She was not clothed anymore. She was naked and ugly. That's right. She was naked and ugly because all that shone now was flesh. And flesh is simple. Adam saw a great difference in his wife when he saw her. Instead of frightening back and said, what, what happened to you, woman? <laughs> she said, come here and I'll give you this. It's wonderful. It tastes good. Look here, it's going to make us wise. If Adam had not sinned, sin would not have been passed on to the human race still, did you know that? But he chose to sin because he didn't want to be separated from that woman. That was unclothed and ugly. And he became unclothed and ugly also. Because they saw, what did they see in themselves? When you come to the age of accountability, what do you see in yourself? <coughs> sin. You see sin in your life. You know what sins that you have in your life and in your mind and in the depths of where you live. You know what sins those are. And you get convicted of those sins and you're sorry and you know that that's going to separate you between you and God. And those sins are ugly, aren't they? That's the ugliness that Adam saw in Eve because she was ugly. Then. She was an ugly sinner. No longer clothed the glory of God, but he chose willfully to go that way. And through Adam, of course, we're all the sin nature is passed down to us and where all this death is passed to us. But through Jesus Christ, we can be saved. Isn't that glorious? Having kept themselves the, the, their, their first estate. And then it says, but, there's a strong adversity conjunction, that all of there, that's that strong adversity conjunction. But, that's a, like like coming up to a railroad track with the, with the red lights flashing. But, 
having deserted AWOL. They want AWOL. Who did they go AWOL with? Lucifer. How many millions of angels and spirit beings did Lucifer take with him? Huh? One third. One third of all of the spirit and angelic beings. This is telling us about this. This is one of the one of the places in the Bible that some hidden things are uncovered. They deserted their own homestead, it says here. Oh, it told Terry home. Their rightful place. They deserted their rightful place. Now it says that they're reserved in chains of the great judgment. Do you think that when Adam sinned that he had any idea that he was going to be so far separated from God? The knowledge of evil is a terrible thing. Every now and then we run on to something in life, my wife and I, she'll see something. She said, that's horrible. I said, yeah, that's horrible. That's the world. The world can figure out more stuff to get into. And I mean, they really think it up. But who really is doing the thinking? They're following him. All right? Unto judgment, great judgment. And then it says, uh, everlasting judgment. Look at this word, adios. Adios. This is from Aristotle. This is an Aristotelian, or an Aristotelian word in Greek. Greek words have different origins. And this word, this man, Aristotle, used this term a lot, and it originated with him. Usually the word here is aona which means eternal. But here's a different word. An old word. Real old word. An Aristotelian word used for eternal. Jude picked up some real high language here. This is real high language. How about, uh, what's high Spanish? It's called Castilian or high Spanish, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There's high German. Mm -hmm. Real upper crust, and then there's really, believe it or not, there's high English. Real proper English. High proper English. Well, this here, he uses some real proper words from high Greek, and this is one of the words that, that Jude uses. Now, who was Jude again? Who's writing this? Jude. Jude, as Jesus' half brother, is writing this letter now. Now, he's not so dumb, is he? He's got some education. Where do you think he got this education? <laughs> that, that, according to the history that we have left of Jesus, he was a studier. Do you think that he read Aristotle's works? Do you think that Aristotle's works might have been quoted in the home of, of Jesus and Mary? Evidently. was around back then, was he? All right, huh? No, no, but his works, his writings were. And how about Plato? Yeah, Platonic words, what we call Platonic words, we'll see them also. The word uh, aeonios is Platonic in origin. Plato uh, used that word, the word aeonios, or aeonio, which means eternal again, ages upon ages. From the writer's point of view, you can see so many times a lot about the writer. This writer is educated. We see the book of James also. The book of James is one of the hardest New Testament books. He pours it on sin, doesn't he? Well, so does Jude. And if you want to real, really read a scorcher, you can read the book of Enoch. And I tell you, all of these writers quote Enoch, and Enoch was a preacher against sin. And from what I understand from the book of Enoch and a little bit of historical references back old in history, Noah was preaching those words to the people around him. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, if you preach righteousness, what do you do about sin? 
you preach against sin. You call sin, sin, don't you? Everlasting, all right? Hippo, sophon, tetereken. Under, down, under, thick, gloomy, pea soup, darkness, having been uh, incarcerated. They're guarded and kept. You know that some of the angels that, and, and spirit beings that, that rebelled with Lucifer were so dangerous that they had to be put in jail? Trump, Trump in jail. And are held in jail to this day. There's going to be a time when they're going to be turned out for a short time, and that's during the tribulation period. Is the world bad enough for you right now? What about it? And who's, who is the prince and power of the air today? Lucifer. How about if all of his bad boys are turned loose? How many of you ever watched Jimmy Cagney? Cagney? James Cagney? He always plays the, played the bad guy. He really wasn't a bad guy, but he played a bad guy in the movies. I saw, a, I was sitting down resting today for a few minutes and turned it on, and they were talking about Jimmy Cagney's life, and he was playing these outlaws and everything else. And he went up there, and one of these, uh, a, a train uh, engineer, told him, he, he called him by name, and he said, you shouldn't have done that. Pow! And killed him. And then so, you, you know my name too? Pow! Killed him too. Then he had locked this guy in the trunk of the car. He's playing a bad man. He, he, he locked this man in the trunk of the car, and the guy said, I'm suffocating in here. I'm suffocating in here. He pulled out his 45, let me give you a little air holes, and shot, and shot him full of holes. Terrible. But you know what? There's people like that. Things that happened to my little daughter a few years ago, I never thought would ever happen to me in my childhood, in my life. And I, my wife was telling me today that some little girl was kidnapped here and, and killed and murdered. In the world, would somebody do these kind of things? Why? Who is the leadership of this? <laughs> Satan and his imps. People think that this is desires in their own heart, in their lives, but it is really not. Hitlers at one time didn't grow on trees, but there's a whole lot of Hitlers out there in the world today. There's a whole lot of Mussolini's. There's a whole lot of. Uh, Charles Manson's. A lot of you wicked people. And you know the bad thing about it? It's just called disorders today. It is sin. You know what? Did you say imps? What? Imps. 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 L-I-M-P-S. Imps. Imps. Little imps. Number seven. Hose. Sodama. Sodama. Kai. Gamora. Kai. Hey. Perry. Atos, Hoes, Tone, Homoion, Tropon, Tutois, Ek, Hor, Neos, Sase. That's a hard one, isn't it? Kai, Apilithusi, Opiso, Sarkos, Eteros, Procainte. I'm having trouble reading these words through my writing. <laughs> Degma. Piros. Ionio. Decain. Hiperacuse. Now, now there's, I mean, I have got a load of cross references for this verse. It is tremendous, tremendous. In Genesis 10th chapter, it's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? And the, sexual immorality. the sexual immorality, homosexuality that took place in that city. Well, why doesn't God destroy Los Angeles and San Diego and some of these other sinkholes that are full of this? Why didn't they do that? Why didn't they, they just? <coughs> Why didn't they do it? Because there's innocent people there. Well, there's innocent people there, but why doesn't he do it? 
But didn't you say something about after flooding the earth, you would never do something like that again? That's right. Yeah. Why did he do it? Why did he kill all these rats? As an, as an, as an example that he hates it. He hates this sin. He hates it. God hates it. He only had to do it one time. He doesn't have to destroy every hell hole and on, on the face of the earth that's, that's full of it, does he? No. Because he did it once, it means that he hates it. He doesn't have to do it again. He only flooded the earth once. All right. <laughs> Are there bad people in the world today? Did God have to, would he have a reason to flood the earth again? Sure he would. But why did he flood the earth the first time? To show us he hated it. All right. An example. It says, as or in like, just in the same manner, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? Sodom and Gomorrah. By the way, look at that. That just comes right up straight over in our language, doesn't it? Also, the ones around them cities. Now, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities around them. Now, where was Sodom and Gomorrah as far as we know in history? Right down by the Dead Sea. Matter of fact, a lot of people think it was it was a beautiful flooded plain. It was an oasis. Remember when the, uh, Abraham left uh, the era of the Chaldees, he took somebody with him. His nephew. His name was Lot. Lot and his wife and his daughters. And they went with... Uh, Abraham, a long way. Now, Lot had to have some faith to leave the Ur of the Chaldees. What was the Ur of the Chaldees like? Here was another flooded, beautiful, flooded plain, a highly populated area, highly educated. Did you know that most of the cities in the United States today don't have the number of books in their libraries that they had in the libraries in the Ur of the that they had plumbing in those buildings and everything. He left a highly advanced city to walk out into the desert and follow God. Well, Lot went with him because evidently he must have believed in Abraham and believed in Jehovah God that he called him. Well, Paul had a thorn in his flesh. Did you know that? Paul spoke of a thorn in his flesh. What a thorn in his flesh. I don't know what it was, but the Lord saw fit not to remove it. Lot was Abraham's thorn in the flesh. He had a wife that, that her name meant contentious, grumpy, grumpy. Her name was Sarai. Sarai means complainer and grump and contentious. That's what she was. God changed her name to a, the, a princess. All right? And Lot had a wife, and I don't know what kind of woman she was, except that we have one example of her in the Bible. <coughs> what happened to Lot's wife? She turned into a pillar of salt. By the way, there's pillar, there's a lot of salt right there by the Dead Sea. There's a great big salt deposit there today. My friend Walt West, he's gone on now, but he died. But they, Marathon all over and drilled some core drillings in that area. And they said that they down deep in the ground that they co uncovered pottery and stuff that was just melted by it, intense heat. And there was many people's bones, all kinds of stuff and it was just full of atomic power. Like an atomic bomb had been set off there. And just burned it up with intense heat. It just kept on burning it. The stuff was melted. The sand was melted in the glass. And he said it still had a lot of radioactive material in it from this. They, the, the, the core samples were so radioactive they had to put them in lead cases because they had so much radiation in it. But he said, we know one thing. That's where Sodom and Gomorrah were. It's a real place. Lot's wife really looked back and God turned her into a pillar of salt because of her sin. This really happened. These are real things that actually happened. These are not fairy tales or stories. These are real, actual, historical facts. God hated the sin of this city. 
look back in, in Genesis, the 10th chapter, and find out what happened. God, first of all, had come to Abraham before this period of time and told Abraham, Abraham, come here. I'm going to make a cub covenant with you and with all of your seed from now on. And of course, remember, Abraham at this time had one ungodly son. One son of the flesh that he loved. And he wanted that to be his child. And who is the father? That, that child today is the father of all the Arab nations that we're having so much trouble with and Israel is having so much trouble with. That was Abraham's sin. That was his child of the flesh. He was Ishmael. If you talk in Arab, Ishmael is the father's son. But according to the word of God, and according to God's revelation to us, Ishmael was a son of sin, the son of flesh. His mother was an Egyptian. And Egypt is a type of the world, a type of the fleshly desires that we have. Abraham loved his son Ishmael. You know, Sarah said, you know, I don't have a child, and God's promising you a child. He must want us to help him out. So you just take my handmaid, Hagar, and you take her for your wife and bring up a child for her. And of course, he said, oh, sure. Great. That's wonderful. I'll do it. And he did. That was... How many of his children have died by the hands of the other children because of what he did by them? <laughs> how many times will your children suffer because of your sin? Abraham left a legacy of hate and absolute murderous race of people living in the world today, killing everybody else. I mean, Islam, the Arab nations, if you're not a member of their sect, they'll kill you. I mean, even another Islam, they don't even like each other. They're over there, they're sending their little bitty babies out with bombs on them and, and, and killing their babies. Tell them to pull up the trigger when they get in there. Little baby don't know any better. Go in there and pull this thing when you get in there among the soldiers over there and blow the little baby up. All well, the baby's going to go to the beatific vision where Mohammed is. Mm -hmm. This is the father of false religion right here that we're talking about. Abraham's son Ishmael. And Abraham said, God told, Jehovah God told Abraham, Abraham, listen to me, Abraham. I am going to give you a son by your wife, Sarai. Oh, no, God, this bless Ishmael. I did it already. I would have taken care of that. God said, no. I'll bless him, all right. He's going to have 12 princes come out of him. And he'll be a blessing. He's going to be, become great. Mighty nation. What happens? <coughs> the sin of our flesh. What happens? It comes back. Now the old term, the old chickens come home to roost. Abraham could not foresee ahead the misery that he gave his descendants <coughs> by being with that woman. That had that child. The misery that he would give to his descendants. Just think about how many people. Think about Eve in the Garden of Eden looking at all the trees that God had given her to eat of. And she goes over here and chooses the wrong one and listens and talks to the snake. Look at the legacy she has given you. Legacy of sin and pain and death. How many of her children are in hell today screaming and will be screaming forever because of what she did? The cities around Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed between 1900 and 1898 B.C., by the way, somewhere around that, that time, about 2,000 years before Christ. This is what all this took place. 2,000 years before Christ, God hated it. And by the way, he'd already sent blood before this happened. He already had judged sin. He already told us how much he hates sin. 
Abraham tempting God, God appeared to him in the flesh now, in the person of Jesus Christ. He came to him and, and sat there with him and, and in his tent and talked with him and ate his food. And he told Abraham, Abraham, this time next year I'm going to visit you again, and by that time your wife Sarah will have a child. And he laughed. And Sarah laughed. And God said, you'll name that child laughter. Because <laughs> you laughed at me. He said, do you think there's anything too hard for me to do? He said, do you think it's too hard for me to make you have a child from that old dried up woman? 90 years old, and you're 100? Do you think it's too hard for me to have, make you have children? Is that impossible for me to do, Abraham? No, but just bless my son. I mean, Ishmael already did it. Religion of the flesh. A blessing of the flesh. It wasn't a blessing. It was a curse, wasn't it? Ishmael was a curse, not a blessing. Ishmael would be a curse of all his descendants of the truth. From then on. Because he went his way. And he said, the cities in like fashion, homion tropon, in like matter. This is what you call an adverbial accusative, by the way. To these cities, having the hoard out. That's what it literally says. Having the hoard out. You about her hung out? These people were whoring out. That's exactly what it says having whored out, having committed whoredom and fornication and homosexuality. That's all in this word right here. Licentiousness. Another term that describes this is aselgia. And we saw that one last week. Aselgia. Unbridled lust. They did not try at all to suppress their evil desires. They just fanned the fires. Having done this, and having gone away, O piso sarcos heteros. What does that mean? After different flesh. Different flesh. These were wicked, wicked people. They not only were homosexuals, but they were using animals for sexual objects also. And some writers say that they were, again, they wanted to. What happened when the two angels went with Lot in Sodom? What happened to them? They wanted to have sex with them. The men came in, they saw these good-looking men, and said, we, we want them. We want to know them. We want to have sex with those guys. We like them. They're different. Different flesh. We want, we're not satisfied with what God, how God has made us. We've got to change things. Sin. Hard-headedness. Romans 1 and 2, verse 27. Someone turn there for me. Romans. Anybody got Romans? <laughs> Romans 1 and verse 27. Marilyn, did you bring your Bible with you? Anybody bring a Bible? Yeah, I have it, but you know what? Romans. Okay, you want me to tell you what page to go to? Yeah. All right. Okay, well, I'll tell you. Romans 1 and 27. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and Romans. Okay? Romans 1. Paul talks about the same situation here. 1 and verse 27. Yeah. In the same way men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with the lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. What, what do you think the due penalty was? Yeah. You killed them. Paul says again in the New Testament that he killed them. After different flesh, you know, God made a man and woman to fit together real good in the act of sex. It's really, he did. He, 
He really made us to fit together real good. Anything else is not exactly right. Okay? Mankind through perversion. Now, what is perversion? What is perversion? It's to make something crooked and difficult. That's what perversion is. It's to make something difficult. You think a man and a man could ever have a child? Or a man, a woman, and a woman could ever have a child? It'd be pretty difficult, wouldn't it? Pretty crooked, pretty wrong. They got to change things. They, God is a master planner. Did you know that? He's a master creator. He created things the way they're supposed to be. You know that God didn't even want us to breed horses and donkeys together. People did that. But people do that. They're, they're breeding horses and zebras. And of course they are sterile. They can't produce after that. But man, they, they thought a, a mule was better than a donkey and a horse. Well, people will swear up and down that a mule can work harder and do different things if you can watch out for his heels. They're deadly. <laughs> but people try to improve on what God has done. They have Man has bred turkeys that they can't even breed. They have to artificially inseminate them because they can't even procreate on their own. It's sad. Perverting what God has given us. I think it would be a really good idea to just leave things the way God created it and just let it go on and go by His rules. We always have a better idea. Remember, we ate that apple. Yeah. So now we're as smart as God. Yeah, we're smart like God, see. I want to tell you something. Satan, God did not take from Satan his intelligence when he sinned. He used every wicked, wicked scheme he could think of and concoct when he dealt with Eve. And he uses every wicked scheme today to lead people away from God. And they will claim what they're doing is all right. It's religion. There is more false religion in the world today than there is truth. My teacher Ben Bogart used to say that the, a lie or a false doctrine can get a hundred miles before the truth can get its boots on. Why? Because it's supercharged. Nitrous oxided. <laughs> By Satan himself. These are some hard verses here. This is real hard preaching. Did you know that? This is hard stuff. There's about Genesis 19 and verse 24, 2 Peter 2 and 6 through 10, uh, and 2, 2 and 3, 7, Deuteronomy 29, verse 23, Hosea 11 and verse 8, Matthew 25, 41 through 46, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, Matthew 5 and 22, and Enoch also, if you've got that book, look under chapter 7, verses 1 through 15. Or pages six and seven, if you've got the same printing that I've got. Okay? Genesis 6 1 and 2. All of this is referred to in this verse in the book, in the book of Jude. Number eight. Number eight. I might. I might go back to number six. Number seven, I mean. <laughs> I've got some things that I want to read to you. This is what the book of Enoch says. This is so closely related to that. I want to read it. I'm not telling you this is absolutely true for anything. I'm just telling you to be aware of it. Okay. It's uh, page six and seven, it says here. Now, somebody read Genesis 6, 1 and 2 for me. Genesis 6, 1 and 2. You got that book, uh, Marilyn? You got that? That's the first book in the Bible. Yeah. The book of Begins. <laughs> you got S's. That Barashith is Hebrew and Genesis is Greek. By the way, we get the word not from Hebrew, but 
for the first book of the Bible. We get it from the Septuagint, which is Genesis. It comes from Edomite. Oh, right. you get six, one and two? Yeah, six and one and two. You know, it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Okay. Well, Enoch in the book of Enoch says that angels married, had sex with women, and had children. I don't know whether that's true or not. I've always didn't believe that. But some of the greatest scholars in history did believe that. What he wrote in that book, and they say in Genesis six one and two that that's what happened. And that was one of the reasons why God sent the blood, because of wickedness. Man can do a lot of wickedness on his own, but satanic influence has got a lot to do with it. And by the way, Enoch names all the angels that married the women. Gives their names. I'm going to give some of them to you here tonight. Okay? <coughs> he says in here, That he said that the people's hearts were malignant and their words were blasphemous toward God at this period of time. It said uh, that it happened after the sons of men had multiplied in those days that the daughters were born to them, elegant and beautiful. And when the angels, the sons of heaven, beheld them, they became uh infatuated with them, saying to each other, Come, let us select for ourselves wives from the pod progeny of men, and let us beget children in our image. These are angels. These are these fallen angels. All right? I know some of you have never heard of this before. This is one of the theories. And I just want to throw it out to you. I want you to be aware of it, okay? Then their leader, San Yaza, he names the leader said to them, I fear that you may perhaps be indisposed to the performance of this enterprise, and I, and that I alone shall suffer for so grievous a crime. But they answered him and said, We all swear, and bind ourselves by mutual execrations, that we will not change our intention, but execute our projected undertaking. Then they swore all together and all bound themselves with mutual execrations, their whole number was 200 who descended upon Argus, which is at the top of Mount Armon. That mountain, therefore, was called Armon because they had sworn upon it and bound themselves by mutual execrations. These are the names of their chief. Samayesa was a leader. Uraka, Baramiel, Akabiel, Timiel, Ramiel, Daniel, Azekel, Zarakanyal, Azael, Armors, Batral, Anani, Zibabi, uh, Samazabel, Ertiel, Turiel, Yamael, Arezitial. These were the perfects of the 200 angels, and the remainder were all with them. Then they took wives, each choosing for himself. I can't remember doing this. I forget to turn that thing over sometimes. <clears throat> Each choosing for himself whom they began to approach, with whom they cohabited, teaching them sorcery, witchcraft, incantations, dividing the roots and trees, and the women conceiving brought forth large, gigantic children. When they turn themselves against the men in order to devour them, they begin to be cannibals. They cannibalize other men. Not only did they cannibalize other men, but they began to eat the animals. The animals have never been killed before. The animals didn't kill each other. And they began to eat them the flesh of one another and to drink their blood. And the earth reproved the unrighteousness. Moreover, Aziel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and the fabrication of mirrors for the women. So they look, look at themselves. See how pretty they were. And the workmanship of bracelets and ornaments. 
and the use of paint and the beautifying of the eyebrows and the eyelids. The use of souls of every valuable and select kind and all sorts of dyes so that the world became altered. The creation became altered. Impiety increased, fornication multiplied, and they transgressed and corrupted all their ways. Amazarach taught all the sorcerers and dividers of roots. Armors taught the solutions of sorcery. Barakayel taught the observers of the stars. Abekitbiel taught signs. Taniel taught astronomy. And Azrael taught the motion of the moon. And men began being destroyed, cried out, and their voice reached unto heaven. And it says here, Samuel also taught sorcery to whom you have given authority. He said he taught sorcery. What is sorcery? Remember? That's witchcraft. Mm-hmm. All right. And then it says God sent watchers over all the earth. Watchers. Angels. To look and record these deeds. And after this is when God started preaching through Enoch and then through Noah, and Noah built the ark, and then the earth was destroyed by water. How much of this is inspired of God, and what really happened, I don't know. But there's some evidence you have from history. Many of the Christians down through the age believe that this book was inspired of God, and these things actually did happen. I thought I would bring them to you, and let you look at it, and see for yourself, and judge for your own self what you think about it. Verse 8. We'll finish this one and then we'll turn you loose. Omeos. Mentoi. Kai. Kutoi. Enup. Mizomenoi. Sarka. Men. Mian Nusen. Kurio Teta. They. Athetusen. Doxos, they, Blasta Musen. Likewise, indeed also, or in the same manner, indeed also, these ones <laughs> hypnotized in the flesh. Hypnotized. What do you do when you hypnotize something? Huh? They try to control it. Why, they say that, that snakes sometimes move in such a way as the, the prey, their food, will watch them and not, and not run from them because they're so intrigued by the, the way the animal moves. And this is the killer they're watching. And all of a sudden they just keep watching, they can't keep their eyes off, and all of a sudden they're dead. They're caught in the clutches of this monster. But they have been so mesmerized by it, that they stay there even though it will kill them. Sin is a killer. Sinful deeds are is a murdering deed. We, these things kill us. It's true. Sin is not good for you. God wouldn't... You know, God doesn't say, don't go do this because it's it, 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 it'll make you feel better. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to have fun. Don't do this because it'll be fun. He's not trying to keep you from having fun. He's trying to keep you from misery. Keep you from misery. And indeed, also, these ones being hypnotized, dreaming, being mesmerized in the flesh. Indeed, they defile and corrupt. It says, it says that rulers and dignitaries, Kirio Teta, God has many <coughs> sub-authority agents under him. 
were called, they're called angels. Guardian angels, they're called well, Michael and Gabriel. And, uh, and Enoch names a whole mess of them. He names some of the guardian angels, too. Some of the good angels. He names the bad ones, he names the good ones. He names basically seven archangels. But we know from the Word of God that they're Michael and Gabriel. That's an absolute fact. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Lucifer is the bad one. We know that Michael and Gabriel are very powerful emissaries or dignitaries of God. Don't we? But the book of Jude say here that the people in Sodom and Gomorrah despised the angels that were sent to them. They humiliated them. They wanted to rape them. They despised their authority. They despised it. Hated it. I, last Sunday, Brother brought a, an illustration that was very good, and I think I'll repeat it to you tonight because it's so much for right here. There was a woman that had a son on death row because he was a murderer. And he'd never shown any sign of repentance or, or sorrow or wrongdoing at all. He was a jerk. Well, the mother had written the governor of Oklahoma, I believe it was, many, many letters. And she couldn't no answer. Finally, just a few days before her son was to be executed, and she knew that the governor was a Christian man. And this was a poor mother that loved her son. She went in there, and when she saw the secretary leave the room, she dashed into his office and ran in there and begged this fellow at his feet and said, I beg you for my son's life. I beg you for his life. He said, my son murdered people, and he's never shown repentance. And she said, he's going to die and go to hell forever. I know. And she said, I, I've tried to call you. I've tried to write letters to you. I've tried to do everything. You can go in and talk to my son and see if you can turn him around to see if you want to pardon him, fine. But she said, in the state that he is in, she said, even if he's executed, if he knows Jesus, I'll be with him again. Right now, I'll never see him ever again in eternity. He's doomed to hell forever. And he was sentenced to hang. Well, <clears throat> he said, you know, he said, uh, I know of your son, and I have known from people saying that he does not show any remorse at all. I don't think that there's any way that he can possibly be recycled back in the side, or even really left in prison. But she said, I'll promise you that I'll go personally and I'll see this man. I will go preach Jesus Christ to your son. And I'll see if he shows repentance or anything, or whatever, I'll see. Maybe I will commute to, to life sentence instead of execution. And she said, please, she said, it would, I, she said, I would be forever, forever thankful. And he said, I promise you I will. So the day before he was going to be executed, the governor went to his cell. And the guy was an absolute jerk. And he sat right there on his bed like this. The governor didn't tell him who he was. He just opened up the, the jail, had him open the jail cell. He went there and sat on the cot right across from him. He sat down there in the chair and, and said, I want to tell you about Jesus. That Jesus loves you and that he died for your sins. He said, you are a wicked, wicked man. And you deserve to die and everything. But he said, I'm here to talk to you and, and, and see if you're going to repent. See if you have anything left in your life, any conscience at all there that can turn you around to God and make you useful to live in this world. This boy didn't say one word to him. He totally ignored him all the time he was there. And he was there for like an hour trying to talk to him. The governor finally just gave up walked to the door and says, let me out. I walked down the deal like that. And then he heard the guard say, 
Boy, he said, that guy's tough. He said, even a governor couldn't reach you. And the boy said, what did you say? Who was that? He said, that's the governor. He came in to talk to you to see if he could turn your life around, to see if he was going to pardon you. He said, the governor? The governor? The governor was here? He said, yeah, he came. He might have commuted your sentence, but you wouldn't even talk to him. He said, the governor. The governor was here. He said that all the way to the gallows. Jesus Christ is that way. He shows us the truth. He shows us right from wrong. He lays it out in front of us, and He can commute that sentence of hell. But we won't even talk to Him. I guarantee you one thing, when they were snapping His neck, He wished that He could have talked to the governor one more time. When anybody breaks into hell, they'll wish that they had repented of their sins and talk to Jesus. But it's too late. Sometimes in my life I've had people call me and talk to me and say, my son was killed. Pray for him. My daughter was killed. Pray for him. It's too late. When somebody's dead, it's past they're past helping. Sodom and Gomorrah could have repented. Do you know what Abraham told the Lord God of heaven, Jehovah? He said, Jehovah, if there's 50 people there in Sodom, will you destroy it because there's 50 righteous souls there? He said, no. How about 45? How about 30? How about 20? How about 10? Just 10 people. Abraham thought, well... Lot has bound to have made some converts in Sodom. Surely, it's, here is Lot and his wife and his two daughters. That's four. And surely they got some personal friends that are saved and they are those two daughters are engaged. Surely he's not going to let his children, his daughters, marry lost men. So it will work out to be that number. When he was, when, when, the Lord God went into Sodom. There wasn't even five people righteous. Lot flopped. Lot did not do what he was supposed to do. His own to be sons in laws that were going to be his sons in laws wouldn't even listen to him when he told them they needed to leave the city. He drug his daughters along, he drug his wife along. There was four of them leaving the city. And one of them looked back and turned into a pillar of salt because she wasn't fit to leave it. His wife wasn't even saved. She was turned into a pillar of salt. And this unrighteous child of God, the Bible says that his soul was saturated in this sinful state. And God had to snatch him out of it. Snatch him out for his soul's sake. Because he lived in that cesspool, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he took his two daughters out. And the wickedness, they committed incest with their own father and raised up children. Because he said, well, this is the only man we're going to have, so let's, so let's get our father drunk. Have children like him. This is all of the Bible. Is. All of these sins that we have with us in the world today that God hates. It's still, he still hates them. It's still down there. It says, They that despise the glories of heaven and blaspheme and rail at God. Blaspheme and rail at God. And we'll finish there. We'll start with with the uh, verse 9 next week. What is the date today? 717, 2002. All right. I hope you learned something from the Word of God tonight. hope you can carry it with you. It is inspired God.
It is His Word. It is His inspired Word. Scott, would you dismiss us in prayer? Sure. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to hear.